thank you so very much for joining us this day for worship here at Starkville First United Methodist Church. We have an exciting time of worship in store for you this day. Uh, we look forward to And I pray that whatever we say or do here today will not only glorify God, but also will touch you and your family in a very special and powerful way. Thank you again for joining us for worship. Let's go now. Still the greatest treasures remain for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasures remain for those who gladly choose you now. And come, now is the time to walk. Father, we're just, we're so grateful that you could bring us here today, Lord. It's, it's been cold outside, but your light is just shining down on us, just bringing us warmth, bringing everything warm from this, on this beautiful earth, Lord. I just pray that you can just open our hearts, Lord, to your worship today, and that you'll just bring us closer together in fellowship, Lord, because it's, it's about us worshiping you together, Lord. We just pray that you'll just give us strength. And you just give us patience, Lord, that we can see everything that you want us to feel. Feel everything that you want us to feel. And just worship you freely and openly. Amen. Sing God of wonders with you. Start off, Lord of all creation. Lord of all creation.
universe declares your majesty. song is your love is extravagant and let's just sing about God's love we're all here together if you want to on the sides over here if you can find room to scoot in I just want us to just share the warmth of the Lord to share the love of the Lord right now and just sing about his extravagant love if anybody over here wants to invite somebody that they see that they know or nobody that they know to come over there and just sit and worship with them and just do it I feel I feel like we should all just share his extravagance and just just be blessed by each other's presence in the Lord
Praise to the giver. Praise to the giver of good things. Merciful Father, Holy King. Yeah. Join with the angels, sing out loud. Grace in the rains above the clouds.
brokenness is what you want from me. Amen. I, uh, somehow I felt like a rock star just a little bit. Don't look like one, but I felt like one uh, when Raymond said, uh, before Jason gets to the stage on this first, <laughs> I just kind of got tickled. And I thought, oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, I, I've, been, I've always wanted to achieve rock star-like status, and well, I've arrived. Thank the Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, what a, what a funny song to, to sing to pray for brokenness, to pray for your spirit to essentially tear us down and build us back up. Dear God, none of us want that, but dear God, we all recognize we need it. And dear God, I pray that in this day, that all those areas in our life that we haven't given over to you, those areas that we have held on to as our own, Dear God, we do pray that you break us from those chains, those, those things that hold us to, in bondage to self. Dear God, help us to break free from that. Help us to recognize and realize that until we are completely broken to the point that we're able to just be molded by you, that we'll never be the people that you've created us to be. Dear God, thank you for those times in our lives when, whether we want it or not, you recognize the need to, to be set free. And dear God, thank you for doing that. Thank you for setting us free. And as we go through this day, I pray, dear Lord, that as we look within ourselves and take a, evaluate where we are with you, if there are areas that we have yet to be broken of and broken in. I pray, dear God, that we would allow you to do that on this day. In your name we pray. Amen. In 1915, excuse me, in 1513, in 1513, there was this man named Juan Ponce de Leon. Anybody ever heard of him? Well, he went in search of a pool of water, a lake, a fountain. He went in search of water. And in this water, it was thought to believe there was some type of special powers. It was thought that in this water, if you found it and you drank of it, that it would keep you young forever. And so he was in search of the fountain of youth. And well, he never found the fountain of youth as we understand, but he did discover Florida in the process, which we're all grateful for, right? We're grateful for Florida and grateful for those sandy beaches. And funny that he found Florida, the place where many go and the place where many scientists says if you go too much, well, you get old quicker. So he found, not the fountain of youth, but he found the place where, well, it says if you spend too much there, then you get old. And the story, for most of us, probably sounds far-fetched, doesn't it? The idea that there would be a body of water somewhere in this world where if we found it, we could drink of it and remain young forever. It sounds far-fetched. But even if you think about it being far-fetched, 
In the 21st century, we're still trying to achieve that very thing, are we not? We're still looking for that fountain of youth. Do you realize what the number one or the fastest growing, the fastest growing field in the medical community is? Yep, cosmetic surgery. Cosmetic surgery. It's the fastest growing field within the medical community. Why is that? It's because people are in search of eternal youth. Are we not? Anybody ever heard of cryogenics or huh? It's a place where they take your body when you die and freeze you. They freeze you. And they freeze you with the hope that one day scientists will figure out a way to bring you back to life. That's what their hope is. People are saving their DNA nowadays. That way after they die, if scientists figure out a way to bring you back to life, they can take your DNA and inject it back into something or you and bring you back out of the grave. Yeah, all of this, from, from, from the very beginning of time, people have been in search of, well, eternal life. People have been looking for a way to live forever. People are looking for a way to never die. Well, I tell you, that's a, a subject that none of us really want to talk about, but it's a subject that all of us will have to one day consider, and that's death. Death comes to us. Death happens, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, we all must die, whether it be through the grave or through the second coming of Jesus Christ. We all must die because... We can't take this body, this sin-filled, dirty body into this perfect place called heaven. So we all must die. There must, be, there must be some type of death, some type of moment in our life when we are transformed in order to be welcomed into heaven. Death, death death. Even Jesus had to deal with death in a very real way, but in a very personal way as well. He had a friend named Lazarus who was the brother to Mary and Martha. And if you, if you remember the story, Mary and Martha were very instrumental in being there for Jesus as he made his journey to the cross. Have you ever heard of Mary and Martha? All right, some of you are sitting there like you're just kind of confused by the whole thing. But, we're all, but we, all, we all have to deal and grapple with the idea that no matter how, how much we spend on cosmetics, no matter how much we spend in the tanning booth, no matter how much we spend in the weight room or in the gym, no matter how much we spend... Uh, trying to uh, preserve our facial features and all this can, and, and, and slow down the process of getting old. No matter how much we want to invest in that, the reality of it is there's nothing, there's nothing, nothing. Did I say nothing? Nothing that can keep us from experiencing death. And honestly, honestly, it's not a negative thing. Well, back to Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha were good friends of Jesus. And they were good friends with Lazarus. And so in today's text, what has happened is that Lazarus, Jesus' friend, has become sick. And Mary and Martha, knowing that Jesus would want to know 
and also knowing that Jesus had the ability and the power to keep Lazarus from being sick, has sent for, for Jesus and said, your friend Lazarus has become ill. Would you come? So that's kind of what happens in our text today. And let me read for you just a few verses of this story. In John chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and washed his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So his sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of the world. But those who walk in night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Isn't this a strange occurrence that we have happening here in this text? It's strange because, one, Jesus does love Lazarus, and Mary and Martha, no doubt, when they were called to go, when they, when they went and called for Jesus to come, what were they thinking? They were thinking, well, Jesus loves us. He's a friend of ours. And as soon as he hears that Lazarus is sick and Lazarus is dead, that he will immediately drop what he's doing. He will come to, to our aid. And it's, we're reminded that continually, as these scientists and these doctors work every single day trying to create a human being, trying to bring life to dead people and dead things. We're spending billions of dollars every year. And the sad reality of it is, it's made available to us for free. It's made available to us all for free. Yep. You can have eternal life. You can live forever. Well, how do you do that? Heck, if, if, you have, if the answer is that simple, then why ain't, everybody, why ain't everybody seeking that? Well, that's a good question. I ask myself that all the time. Well, the problem is, the problem as I see it, it's simply found in the way we go about achieving eternal life. For most of the world, we believe that it's something that we can do for ourselves. And the only way we feel like we can do it is if we do it for ourselves. But the reality of it is to have eternal life that's offered to us for free through a man named Jesus Christ, it means death. Not just a physical death, but it means a death spiritually. No, I don't, want, I don't mean that we, we, we have no spirit about us. We die spiritually and thus cease to, cease to have any measure of life. But what I mean is die spiritually in the sense that we give over our spirit to God, to allow God to, to, to then take that spirit and mold the spirit into who God wants us to be. Death in that sense is not negative. Death is in that sense is a positive because then we can understand what it is not only to be who God wants us to be, but also we can have eternal life in heaven. People are searching, people are looking, people are spending money every day trying to find the one thing that could bring eternal life, and honestly, it's already been paid for. 
All we have to do is accept it. Well, the disciples were still a little bit confused by this whole story that's unfolding in front of us this day. Much like I am when I read this story because, see, I, I think in my mind, I, I just want to say to Jesus, why don't you just go right then when he's sick and just go on over there and, and, and do what you're going to do and just, and just touch him and bring him back to life. You know, it just seems much simpler if Jesus was just do it the way I think he should have done it. But then if he did that, Jesus reminds me, just as he reminds the disciples, well, if I did that, then it wouldn't have the same effect. Because, see, in the Jewish custom, it says that a person to be officially dead has to be dead more than three days. On the fourth day, that person then is really dead. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's, that was the custom. And so Jesus waits, beyond, waits three days, and he goes to his friend, Mary and Martha. And quite honestly, Mary and Martha are a little bit upset at Jesus. Well, why didn't you come? If you had been here already, the Scripture says, then, then, then Lazarus wouldn't have died. And they were kind of giving Jesus a little scolding about the whole thing. And then Jesus kind of goes, goes back to them and said, Did I not tell you if you believed he would live? And he, she said, Yeah. And it was almost like he's asking the question. He said, why did you doubt? Just because I'm three days late, why are you doubting? Good question. But then Jesus goes on to the grave, goes on to where they have buried Lazarus. In verse 38, he says, Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus says, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because you've been dead four days. In other words, she's saying, there's no way he's going to be able to live. He's been dead too long. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this, for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face, uh, face unwrapped in the cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. I tell you, this story, again, has, has so much, so many rich possibilities and, it, and, it, and, and, and this story teaches us so many wonderful truths about Christ and it also teaches many truths about ourselves and in the story we learn that death is reality as I've already said death is reality it comes to all of us and there's no amount of money that you can spend in this life that's going to keep that from happening but from the same sense death in the, from a Christian's perspective is a good thing because we have to put this body, this life, to death. We have to put it away. We have to daily, as Christians, rise, die to self and rise anew to Christ. We have to do that every single day. So death isn't just, for us as Christians, it isn't just something that happens at the end of our life. It's something that we do every single day. And the ultimate transition will be that day that Christ calls us to heaven, whether it be through the grave or through the rapture or the second coming of Christ. Jesus teaches death is not the end of it all. It's only the beginning. Jesus also teaches in this, I love the whole image of Lazarus being dead and being bound by cloth and in this grave. Because I think sometimes that's where I am. <laughs> and I think that's where sometimes many of our church folk are. We're, we're, we, we have just kind of fallen away. We, we've just kind of been wrapped up and bound up by life. And although we may have not died physically, we've, we've died spiritually. We've died joyfully. We've, we've died in so many ways. And I love that imagery of Christ going to that, going to that grave and we're telling his disciples, one, I'm going to the grave to wake him up. I'm going to wake him up. 
And he goes to that grave, and he says with a loud voice, Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And said, Lazarus comes walking out, hands and feet bound, his head covered in cloth, and, 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 and Jesus immediately says, unbind him and let him go. You know, that, that, that can be, I can hear Jesus saying that for us right now. You've been bound up by things. You've been bound up by fear. You've been bound up by uncertainty. You've been bound up by uh, the wants of life. You've been bound up, and, and because you've been bound up, you're, you're, you've just died. There's no life in you at all. Oh, yeah, you may physically live, but there's no light, no life in your eyes or in your, in your heart or in your spirit. And I can just hear Jesus saying, Wake up! Come forth! And take these things off and live. There's so many great truths in this text this morning. But of all of them, I think that's the one that I want to leave you with. Jesus is calling from us for us to come out of our graves. Our graves and be set free, be loosed from those things which bind and go and live. I think what drives all of our Fear surrounding death and, and fear around letting go of those things which we are secured by. I think the fear in all of that is, is, well, we're not sure about tomorrow. We're not sure about what tomorrow brings, and because we're not sure and we fear that, then we, we, we hold on to those things which even, yes, those things which even keep us in bondage. Because there's in, in some psychological reasoning, there's security even in those things that bind us. But I can hear Jesus proclaiming from the mountaintop right now, break free, trust me, and don't worry about tomorrow because I'm already there. And in me, you have life, and life eternally. I love, my, I guess my favorite verse, my favorite passage of Scripture, and this whole text comes in verse 25, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asks a very important question. He says, do you believe this do you believe this well church let me just say to you as, as christians if you say yes i do believe that then i think we need to be awakened from our graves we need to be awakened from our slumber we need to be awakened to the reality that there are things in this life that we need to die to and allow christ to raise us anew not just tomorrow not just on Sunday, but every single day of our life. And Christ says, if you do this, you will live. Not just in the sense of living in heaven, but in the sense of living every day. Living knowing that you're free, that you're not bound by life, you're not bound by death, you're not bound by things that you don't know or don't understand, because you've been set free to live by the Spirit of God. And I, folks, I hope you know this, but the Spirit of God isn't bound by anything. It empowers. So I say to you in a loud voice, Church, come forth. Remove those things which bind you. And go and live. Go and live. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank You that in You, in Your Son, Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. 
And dear Lord, this text is so rich, and I know, dear God, this morning that I did not, we did not do justice to it at all. But dear God, let us hear, let us hear that one lesson that we need to hear in it today. Dear God, maybe it's the lesson that, that de- we should not fear death because in death we can be made whole through you. Maybe it's that we need to die, put to death those things which have are hindering us from being totally in love and sold out to your service. Maybe it need, we need to be awakened from our slumber and from our sleep and Dear God, maybe we need to be awakened from uh, sleepwalking through this great, wonderful journey called life. Dear God, maybe we just need to be called, we, we need to respond to your call to come up out of the grave and once again grab life and live life and enjoy life and allow the light of Christ to shine through us so the world can see. You got to free us today from anything that binds us. And may we leave here able to live freely for you. In your name we pray. Amen. The altars are open. Come as the Spirit leads you.
if you would stand and join us as we sing our closing chorus. And let's just leave this day today being blessed by his name and just bring passion to the world around us that we can just come back here the next Sunday and just worship. I'm just so glad that I got the opportunity to worship with you all today. I just hope that you all have a blessed day. You know, I was thinking just now, I thought, you know, these guys and these girls, these ladies could be playing and singing anywhere in this world. They could be any in any bar, any honky-tonk, but thanks be to God, they're in worship with us on Sunday morning, right? What an amazing, amazing band. And we even have half of them on spring break, snow skiing in Brazil, and just throughout this whole world so hey you know what an amazing group they're even uh, working during spring break many of them not steven steven's having fun but skip is actually in brazil making a difference in the world so hey you know what an amazing group uh thank you for being here and uh you know i'm like raymond thank you for the opportunity to just to get to be here and worship with you and spend an uh almost an hour with you on this day Christ is continually calling us every day to come forth and be free to live a life that is pleasing to God.
but also that draws others unto you. Go and live like free people. Be blessed. Blessed be the name of God. Blessed be your